Good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning. Would you stand as we prepare our hearts for worship? Psalm 95 says, Come, let's sing out loud to the Lord. Let's raise a joyful shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before him with thanks. Let's shout songs of joy to him. Would you lift up your praise and your worship this morning as we sing our thanks and our praise to our God? Let's worship him together. continue lifting our praise to the Lord this morning. morning we lift our praise it is a central part of our worship to God in Ephesians chapter 1 Paul writes praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ he then proceeds us to give us many reasons to praise the Lord he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ reasons for praising God include God's gift of salvation and sanctification by the Spirit his adoption his glorious grace his redemption through the blood of Christ, his forgiveness, his gifts of wisdom and understanding, and his plans for the future. When our lives are filled with the righteousness of Christ, our response is to praise the Lord. So this morning, in your thankfulness and your gratefulness, would you lift up your praise to the Lord and worship his name? Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath 
continue lifting our praise this morning. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Father, would our worship this morning be an offering to you? May you be glorified. May your name be made holy. May you be seen and appreciated and praised in our eyes and in the eyes of all the nations for your divine uniqueness and infinite superiority. God, we want to thank you for the wonderful gift of life that you have given us. Thank you for the opportunity and the possibility to always live a new day when we walk with you and in your spirit. Let us exalt your name and your infinite love. We magnify you our God. It is good to be in your presence, to be gathered with one another, to sing your praises, to speak your name, to remind ourselves that you are the only one that is worthy of our praise and to be called holy. God, we want to be like you. Would you continue to work in us to make us more and more like you? We 
We give you this morning, this day, this hour, these minutes together as we stand on holy ground in your presence. Continue to move in us and through us. We know you are here. Would we sense you? We give you all the praise and all the glory, and we pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All things are from God, and we return it all to him. As part of our worship this morning, um, we remind you of our offering boxes that are at the back. Part of our worship is giving back to God that which he has given to us, and we do that through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And so our offering boxes are located in the doors as you enter the sanctuary and as you enter the church building. Um, and then if you're a visitor, right in front of you in the in, in the pocket in your um, seat right in front of you is a communication card, and we encourage you to take a moment and fill that out. Um, we would like to just make sure that you felt welcome today, um, and if you're not a visitor, it's a great way for you to stay in touch with us or to let us know of things going on in your life. Um, <clears throat> this fall, this past fall, we announced a partnership with Kids Hope USA. Um, and um, Kids Hope USA is a national mentoring program that connects local churches with local elementary schools to train and equip the church members to serve as a mentor to an elementary student. Um, mentors meet with their student once a week for one hour, um, and the purpose is to have a caring, consistent adult in the life of that child, much like an aunt or an uncle or maybe a grandparent. Um, and the intent is to meet for multiple years throughout the child's years in the elementary school. Um, and this year we had four mentors that signed up and three prayer partners that supported those mentors in prayer. Um, our mentors were Greg Pizer, Rich Hiltz, Shelby Fairbotham, and myself. And the folks who were praying for us this year were um, Deb Pizer, Kathy Hiltz, and Jackie Hurd. We began the mentoring program in January, which means we have been in the school for 16 weeks, um, and we have been matched up with kindergarten students. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and we, uh, the mentors just met and kind of collected our thoughts and compared our notes. And I have to tell you, we have learned a lot being with these kindergarten students. So let me tell you at least four things. Our students will never ever get bored of Plato. It's not going to happen. And we have learned that sometimes Plato is the preferable activity to something like Candyland or Guess Who because Candyland and Guess Who have winners and losers and sometimes you don't want to go there with kindergarten students. We have learned that one hour a week really is enough time to establish yourself in a student's life. <laughs> and I didn't mean it the way that came out. Um, and the reason I mean this is that they now know when we are supposed to be there. And if you are late, they will tell you you are late. You only need an hour. Um, sometimes we have learned that as mentors, you just want to come in and buckle up because you're in for a ride because they know us so well that they are going to tell us what to do and how to do it. It happens every week. <laughs> Um, and the final thing we have learned is that consistently showing up to see them each week sets up a routine that they can trust. So when we enter those doors, it is all smiles, high fives, and out comes everything they have done over the weekend, all about their family, all about the things that are going on in their life, um, and the things that they're excited about, and what's happening at recess, and the field trip coming up, and it has been wonderful. The students have been a blessing. And we have appreciated the wonderful opportunity that we have to support our teachers and our staff and really to be ambassadors of Christ in the building. Um, last week, Rich and I walked in um, to go to our students' classroom, and out in the hallway was this table of um, five or six students who were working on reading. They were not our mentors, but what was really interesting is there was one sitting there who happens to go to our church, and Rich serves once a month in our children's program, and he walked by and said hello to the student by name, and she scrunched her face looked at him and said, I didn't see you in church yesterday. <laughs> and then all the people around were like, church, what are you talking about? And I realized what a blessing that we as a church have, right? Because we get to be in that building. We get to be serving Christ in that way. And I have to tell you that today, even after 16 weeks of being in there, there are still students that come to me that are not the students we're mentoring. And they say, when do we get to meet with you? 
And so I plant that seed with you now because we have three more weeks and then we'll end for the summer and next week we start, or next year we'll start with our mentors. The four of us will continue with our mentors, but there are, uh, with our students, but there are still a lot of other students waiting for a mentor. And if God leads you to do that, would you let us know? Let Pastor Tim know, let Pastor Sarah know, let me know. We would love to train you to just hang out and play Play-Doh and cars and all kinds of good things with these kids because it's a wonderful opportunity that the Lord puts before us. We're going to stand for a moment and greet one another, so would you pass the peace of Christ? Good morning. You may be seated. The passage we're going to look at this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think there was a, a book called Everything I Learned About Life I Learned in Kindergarten, something like that. Everything I Learned About Life Maybe I Learned From a Kindergartner. Uh, that's a, bit, a little bit different, but uh, I know uh, the same thing. I Sometimes I'll go long in the message, uh, but I've been more aware of that after I served some time in the East Wing with some of those young kids and realized extra 10 minutes is a lot. <laughs> so try not to get it too long, but anyway. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to pick up verse 6. Talked about this passage some the last few weeks and just thought, just felt I needed to, uh, the Lord had something to share with me and something to share with you in, in this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of the age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. But the person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So that phrase really struck me. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit within them. And so I've been reflecting on that phrase all week, well, actually longer than that, um, because it says to me that we have a spirit inside who knows our thoughts. Um, and that's interesting to me. In, in 2000, there was a movie, uh, Mel Gibson starred in a movie where he answered the age-old question, what women want. <laughs> and um, after being electrocuting, electrocuting himself, he was able to to hear women's thoughts and it about drove him crazy as we all would understand uh, and it would not just women's thoughts but everyone's thought because our brains are thinking all the time uh, our brains have a hundred billion neurons those things that connect and receive messages, receive messages and send messages in our brains. A hundred billion neurons, and each of them have like 
10,000 connectors, right? I mean, that number is unbelievable. And, and, and yet it processes things so quickly. It's able, we're able to do what we're able to do because of that. It's amazing. And so our brain never stops thinking. Even when we go to sleep, our brain is very active. It does the house cleaning kind of work. It kind of processes what we've been thinking about throughout the day. But our brain never shuts up. <laughs> And so we think all the time, much of that we can't even put in our conscious mind because it's so much. But we are still aware of thousands of thoughts a day, right? It's hot. It's cold. Uh, did I turn the stove off? Uh, who's, who is this guy talking? And when is he going to stop talking? All those kind of thoughts. Random thoughts. Irrational thoughts. We have weird thoughts. Um, unwanted thoughts. All of us have had them. I, I remember standing on the edge looking over into Niagara Falls and you know what I thought what would it be like if I jumped off and they tell me that most of us have that thought so I'm not that abnormal so so we have these kind of thoughts these weird thoughts these irrational thoughts and and sometimes some of us can't stop thinking of those irrational thoughts right we struggle with that um so we think all the time, and there is this internal dialogue going all the time in our brain, conversations in our head, where we argue, and who are we arguing with? We're arguing with ourselves. <laughs> who do we debate with? We debate with ourselves. Uh, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? This is what's going on. No, it's not. And, and the more debate going on, the more dialogue going on, the more intense it gets, and, and invariably for me, just when the internal dialogue gets really intense inside my brain, that is when Sandy asks me a question. And I think, Sandy, why are you interrupting me? <laughs> it's rude to interrupt. But if she waited for my brain to stop going the internal dialogue, she would never say anything. But you know how it is. We, we get distracted. And sometimes we really struggle, especially as introverts. Uh, we struggle when someone's talking to us because we've got so much going on up here all the time. And, uh, and sometimes it's a blessing that Sandy interrupts my internal dialogue because our thoughts sometimes can lead us astray, right? And we need someone to break that thought train. Um, so we think all the time, and we evaluate and judge things in our world, every event, circumstances, emotions, people. We try to make sense of it because, you see, our brain is our problem solver. Our brain is our problem solver so it can take care of us, so it can protect us. That's why our brain does what it does. It protects us. And so we have to solve problems. We have to, we have to figure things out. And that's a wonderful thing. And then it becomes a hard thing. Then it becomes a bad thing, right? Because we just not need to figure out certain problems. We need to figure everything out. Our brain has this deep desire to bring things to closure, which means we want to figure out what's going on. Why did this happen? Why did she say that? Why is he acting this way? We need to figure everything out. That's why we have this internal dialogue going on. We want to figure it out, and we want to put it in a box and close it up and say, there, now we understand it. And we do that with limited information. We don't have a lot of information. We don't have all the information we need. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we talked about judging, how we judge as if we are in God's place, as if we actually can see everything. But we can't. We're human. And so our, 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 our view is very small. Perspective is very limited. And, and yet we just have a tendency to say, I've got to figure it out. And I'm going to make judgments on everything, on everybody, even when we know we have a limited information. And we see things limited. But we fill in the blanks. We form judgments, we, we t tell stories, we form narratives, we tell stories about ourselves, we tell stories about life, we tell stories about our job, people we work with, our family, everyone. We, we judge everyone, including ourselves, because we just have this deep desire to make sense of things. And so we are always questioning, always trying to figure things out. Someone has said, the voice in our head is like a backseat driver. You know, always questioning us. You're driving too fast. You're driving too close. Why'd you take that turn? Why'd you do that? You know how it is with a backseat driver. It can drive you crazy. Well, no wonder we're stressed. 
I mean, we have this internal dialogue going on all the time, and sometimes we just need someone to say to our thoughts, will you just, pardon the word, shut up? <laughs> will you stop? I have a helpful book that I read once was called Get Out of Your Mind and Get Into Life, right? That's what we need. Because sometimes that mind just keeps going on. So, so this passage really spoke to me, that phrase, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. And what, what was amazing to me is that 2,000 years before Freud and, and modern psychology, Paul is, is giving us some basic psychology, which is we have thoughts, but we have a spirit, and they are not the same. We have thoughts and we have a spirit. They're not the same. You can pay a lot of money to get someone to tell you that you are not your thoughts. And that's, that's worth a good amount of money. That's an important thought, important understanding. Because we tend to think that. We tend to think our thoughts are ourselves. And we own what our thoughts are thinking. We own them as if they are true, as if they are infallible. As if they are the final word. Whatever we think is, must be the final word. So instead of saying, I'm having a depressing thought, I say, I'm depressed. Instead of saying, I'm having a shameful thought, I say, I'm shameful. Instead of having a jealous thought, I'm jealous. We buy into it completely. And so we take those thoughts and we own them. Despite the fact that our thoughts are dependent upon a lot of different factors. I mean, sometimes random things. A song comes on, you're listening to a song in the car, and it just changes your thoughts. And the day is different because your thoughts are a little different. Isn't it amazing how random, insignificant things can change our thoughts? One person makes a comment to us, and it changes the whole way we think about the day. We take thoughts and we own them. But we are not the sum total of our thoughts. There is something deeper to us, deeper than our thoughts, even deeper than our emotions, and that is our spirit. Our spirit is the essence of who we are. Sometimes the Bible will refer to it as a heart. In fact, in the New Testament, it's often interchangeable, the heart and, and the spirit. But the spirit, in particularly, emphasizes that part of us that connects with God. The Spirit enables us to connect with God's Spirit. A capacity to touch God. I love Michelangelo's uh, The Creation of Adam, that picture that he, he did in which the, the two fingers are coming together, the creation of Adam. It is, they're not quite there, but that's the moment when, when God and man are able to touch that we have that capacity to touch, to be touched by God. And that is our spirit. And when we put our trust in Christ, when we put our trust in Christ and become his disciples, the Holy Spirit is given to us and it opens up our spirit to God's spirit. A constant fellowship with God's spirit. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Praise the Lord for that. Rather, the spirit you've received brought about your adoption to sonship and daughtership. We are children of God. And by him, by the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit, speaks to our spirit that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That is the connection. The Holy Spirit interacting with our spirit, this very essence of who we are at the spirit level, at the spiritual level, when we accept Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit tells us and speaks to us, you are a child of God. That's who you are. And, and through the spirit, at the very deepest part of who we are, at the very deepest essence of who we are, we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is the term for dad, basically. The Spirit teaches us at that depth 
to cry out, Abba, Father. He is our Father. And that is what our spirits are made for. Our spirits are made for God. And your desire for God and your capacity to connect with God is the essence of who we are. It is how we are crowned with glory. It is how we are created in the image of God. We are created to live in the image of God, to live in the reflection of God, to live in the presence of God. So your desire for God and your capacity to connect with God is the essence of who you are. The Spirit of God is within us and He is nearer to us, as someone has said, than ourselves. <laughs> he is nearer to us than our own breath. So God gave us his spirit so we could connect, he could connect with us so that he could love us. Ruth Haley Barton says this, we are confronted with a God who is always after us. He's after us today. He's after you and me today. He is seeking us, always looking for us. And who cries out each time he finds us with a divine despair. It's an interesting phrase. I don't know that I fully understand what she means there. But it talks about this deep desire in God's heart to connect with us. And he is after us. He is seeking us. Which is why we often say that we didn't come here just because we wanted to. We came here because God calls us here. Because he wants to fellowship with us. He has that deep desire and scripture says that God is a jealous God and jealousy usually sounds like a bad thing usually it's a sinful thing but in this case that is not the case it is he wants us here he wants us now he wants us totally he wants us unconditionally because he created us for himself he made us for himself and as Augustine says our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him So who knows my thoughts but my spirit? Our spirit in intimate, constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit provides the anchor for our thoughts. Our thoughts can run rampant. It can go all kinds of ways. We know that. Wild, irrational thoughts our spirit in intimate, constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit provides that anchor for our thoughts. When our thoughts deceive us, we go deeper to the Spirit and we hear the voice of God speaking to us. One way of looking at that is like looking at a river. You, you can look at a river and you look at the surface of the river and uh, you can see a lot of things on the surface of the river. You can see the flow of water, you can see currents, you can see rocks jutting out. You can see uh, leaves and sticks and floating down, uh, floating down the river. There's a lot to see, a lot going on on the surface. That's really all we can see with our eyes. But a good fish, fisherman, a fly fisherman like my son-in-law, Matt, can interpret what's going on underneath the surface um, by what he sees on the surface. On one side of the river, uh, the current is faster. There's more ripples. The river is more disturbed. There's a lot going on on the surface there. It's a shallow part of the river. And then on the other side, there is a quieter side, a slower side. Uh, the quieter side is the deeper side of the river. The water is deep. There's, there's more oxygen available. There's bigger fish there. That's where you want to go if you want to catch the big fish, and that's where we want to live, not on the shallow, but in the deep. And you could make that analogy for our thoughts, that at the surface is our thoughts. That's what comes up. That's what, what comes up to our consciousness, this thought. But, but deep inside, there is the Spirit. And when our spirit goes deep into the very heart of God, when our spirit goes deep into the love of God, there is a there is a calmness, there is a quietness, there is a peacefulness. I'm not saying we never have struggles, but there is, there is a peace. But if we cut that out of our life and live just in the shallows, it is 
It is rocky. It is rough. It is full of chaos. So the surface of the river is our thoughts, but our spirit is below the surface, and the deeper you go, the quieter the mind is, the more peaceful the mind is. And so it is one of our calls to go deep. Isaiah 26 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. When our, when our mind is set on the Lord, it will be in perfect peace. Psalmist says, be still before the Lord and wait. Be still and know that I am God. In silence, my soul waits for you, O Lord. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. We find that place of resting in the Lord. We put our trust in Christ. We rest in him and open up our heart to live as he calls us to live. Paul says this, the passage we read, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, Think about the spirit of the world, full of the chaos, full of the conflict, full of the unsettledness. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us, what God has graced us, what he has blessed us with, not something we've earned, what God has freely given us. We're blessed. We have full of hearts full of gratitude. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words, spiritual realities. There is a, a deeper reality going on than the surface. There are, there are better words that need to be said than the dialogue that's going on in our heads. And that, is the, that comes from the Spirit as the Holy Spirit is interceding with us, as the Holy Spirit is talking to us. That deeper wisdom comes out of that. And we respond to life differently. We have new options that we never thought of. We respond differently because we're living at a different place. Circumstances look different because of where we're coming out of. And so Paul talks about when we live out of the Spirit, there is a deeper wisdom, the wisdom of God. And this wisdom is not about us doing on our own or relying on our own strength. It is not about talents and, and resources and using our own wisdom to, to make ourselves good, uh, focusing on achievements and possessions, how smart we are, how talented we are, how strong we are, how good we are. That is, that is usually where we find our identity. So much so that if, if something gets taken away from us that we, that we think is our identity, it breaks us. Because we can have our identities focused on those things, on maybe our job, on maybe our talent, our money. And they become our identity and become sources of pride. We are, we are, we are worth something because we are better than other people in that area. And so we compete with others, we trust in ourselves, and that becomes the core of who we are, and that is very shallow. There's all kinds of things we have to worry about. Jesus said, if you store up treasures on earth, man, you've got all kinds of things to worry about. If this is where you're putting your hope in, in these kind of things, there's all kinds of things you've got to watch out for. But if you trust in heavenly things, you don't have to worry about those because they're rooted somewhere else besides my abilities or my brain or my emotions or my circumstances and so the spirit who is from God provides us another way of living a constant communication with the Holy Spirit deeper than our thoughts deeper than our emotions the essence of who we are as children of God and the wisdom that we get from that is the wisdom of Jesus Christ it is he is our Lord he is the human who showed us how to live it is the wisdom of Jesus Christ it is the wisdom of the cross and the resurrection which absolutely makes no sense to the world people will never understand how you can gain by losing how you can lose your life and you will find life how when you die you get life 
But indeed, all spiritual growth begins with that moment of surrender. It is about letting go. That's what God is going to do in our lives over and over again. Teach us to let go so we can truly embrace what he has for us. Trusting in God. And as we trust in him, we experience a deeper life. And we experience the peace of God because we are living from the depths rather than the shallows. We will not be able to stop unwanted thoughts. They will come. In fact, trying to stop them actually is counterproductive, as I found. Um, what we do is just have to keep going back to the Lord and anchoring our lives in the peace of Christ and then just let those thoughts roll on down the river. <laughs> Perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And always believing in the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, that even though things come into our life that can be challenging, even if the worst, the very worst things happens to us, the power of the resurrection tells us that God can, over, can and will overcome that which is worst. His love overcomes evil. And so we get our confidence there. Well, one more thing before we close is this last verse of the chapter. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That is out of Isaiah 40, uh, the quote that Paul is taking from Isaiah 40. Isaiah is one, 40 is one of the great passages. Israel has turned away from God. Israel has served idols, and they've brought all kinds of terrible things in their life they brought destruction the nation has been practically completely destroyed and there's a sense of hopelessness going on but in Isaiah 40 uh, the prophet begins to say hey God is not done with you yet and he starts off with that great chapter with comfort you my people says your God comfort comfort my people says your God speak tenderly to her because in the middle of your desert, in the middle of these horrible times, I am going to come to you. I'm going to come to you with a mighty arm and with the power to save. I'm going to come to you like a shepherd who takes up the sheep in his arms. But the people respond in Psalm 40 with a complaint. My way is hidden from the Lord. Our cause has been disregarded. In other words, God has forgotten us. That's what they say. And you can imagine with all the difficulties that they were facing, they would conclude that. But the, the prophet responds, why do you say that? Do you think that you, are, you have enough knowledge to try to make that assessment? Do you think you're in a position to make the assessment that I've given up on you? Look at the stars in the sky. Look at the mysteries of the universe, he says. You think you can fathom the Lord's ways? Well, then tell me how that all came about. You think you can understand all that God is doing? Do you think you're in that position to understand the mysteries of creation, and yet you think you can understand all of my ways? Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Who can teach God? You think you can teach God something? And then he says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of, over all the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength day by day. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. That's where Paul gets this phrase from. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? The answer is obviously no one. No one's figured that out, right? But Paul does not stop there. He adds that other phrase. Who has known the mind of the Lord to instruct him? No one. But we have the mind of Christ. And that, that means a lot. Because what that says is that yeah, we, will, we will never 
fathom all of the Lord's ways and there are things that happen that we don't understand and, and it's confusing to us and we will never understand all that God is doing we, we don't have a perspective we are stuck in a particular place a particular time and God is eternal so our perspective is always going to be we will never understand all of his ways for his ways are higher than our ways but we do have the mind of Christ and that is enough to bring us comfort we have the mind of Christ and Jesus Christ showed us exactly what God thought of us didn't he Jesus Christ came into this world he entered the world so that he would be with us he came into this world so he would experience everything we've gone through and he did that he is with us no matter what we've gone through through the Holy Spirit Jesus is with us and he knows what it's like to go through that there's nothing you will face in this world that Jesus hasn't faced even the feeling of God abandoning you even the feeling like Isaiah 40 God has forgotten us Jesus felt that he felt it on the cross but God did not abandon him <laughs> And the resurrection proves that. God never left him. But in his humanity, he felt that God had abandoned him. When we put our trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes residence at the very deepest part of our life. The wisdom of Christ anchors our life. That even in moments in life, when we can't figure them out, when we can't solve the problems... Even when our brain is trying to solve it and we just can't. And, and even when our thoughts oppress us, even when our emotions condemn us, as Paul says, or, or as John says in his epistle, God is greater than our heart and he will put our hearts to rest. We can trust in Christ. We can hold on to his hand and he will lead us confidently through because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And so our challenge is to fall in love with Jesus. That's, that's what it means to go deep. To center our life in Jesus Christ. We won't figure everything out. <laughs> but we'll trust the Lord. I had a phrase that I used at Easter, and I like the phrase. I want to use it again. I read it somewhere. Live expectantly without expectations because you know we, we have expectations and, and every day we have ex I, I expect things to go a certain way as I got up this morning I expected everything to go a certain way and, and, and if it doesn't go that way we expect it, it we get upset right because we like to control our world and when and when we expect certain things and they don't happen, we get upset and we lose focus and we kind of look at the day and it's all awash and we look at circumstances and we're just frustrated, so frustrated those circumstances that we lose sight. That is, that is the mistake we make. Live expectantly without expectations. When life doesn't turn out the way we expect, we still expect God to work in the midst of that. And he is. We won't figure it out, but we surrender that. And day by day, we live through the power of the Spirit, knowing that the power of the resurrection is working through us. So every day we live with some expectation, some expectation of God working, but without the demands that we put on life. And then when life turns away that we didn't expect, we will see beautiful ways that God is working. I have seen that so much in, 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 in the life of my wife, Sandy. I, I'm amazed at how she has been able to keep focused on what the Lord is doing in her life in the midst of this time. And God has worked in her life and, and through her in amazing ways. She is not soaring with eagles. She is not running. She is just walking step by step, and she is not fainting because God is sustaining her. And over and over again, I tell her the same thing. 
We take it a day at a time. And the Lord gives us strength. But even more than that, what he is doing in us is quite remarkable. He's allowing us to go deeper. And when things on the surface are a little crazy, we find our strength in Christ. Let's pray. Maybe there is one here today who has not opened their heart to the Lord, but they've sensed the Spirit calling them. Lord, we just pray right now, we open our heart to you and we put our trust in you. We, we, we want to have you work in our life. And so we've put our faith in Christ right now and we invite you into our life to be the Lord of our life, to be our mentor, our leader. And we want to follow you. We want to anchor our life in Jesus Christ and see the power of the resurrection work through us. Lord, for some of us, Lord, we just need to surrender. We've been holding on to things, expectations and demands. But we need to, we need to say, uh, I know my thoughts are not your thoughts, Lord. My ways are not your ways. I understand that. And I've got to stop demanding that you do exactly the way I, I want. In fact, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be filled with the mind of Christ that every day we look at it from, from your perspective, Lord that we get caught up in what you are doing rather than what we want. We, we want our thoughts to be your thoughts. And so, Lord, would you, would you help us let go of uh, the demands to embrace what you want to do in us because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what you've got planned for us. Lord, we open our hearts to you today. I pray that you would be with the one who is struggling with thoughts that have been oppressive. And I pray that they would hear the spirit, that your spirit would speak to their spirit and let them know that, that they are yours, that they are children of God, that we are brothers and sisters of Christ. Help us to hold on to his hand as he leads us through life. So Lord, we open our hearts anew to you this morning. That the love of the Father and the life of Christ and the breath of the Spirit would quicken within us a greater affection for you and your ways. Lord, work your will in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.